Best for last session of the day. I love that we're talking about these like intense, serious issues like climate change. Well, we're not going to lighten up on you now because we're going to talk about defense. So up next, we are going to talk about disrupting tech's relationship with defense. And who better to do that than a guy who has consulted for the DOD? Hey, can I can I get you guys' attention? If you're going to have little side chats, can you take them outside, please? Psst. Yo. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the end of the day. We just got to keep it light and have some fun. All right, so we are, again, talking about defense. I'm going to skip my fancy intro and just move to it. And we're going to do this in a fireside chat style. Uh, KP Ready is going to be joined by Matt Grimm, the COO and co-founder of Andrel Industries. So why don't you guys both come up? Let's give him a round of applause. The only one to bring props. <laughs> So um, I met Matt, what, five, six years ago when you were at, is it on? Uh, when you were at Mithril, uh, Mithril Capital, uh, Bayer VC. And since then, uh, you moved on to Andrew. But could you just briefly? Well, we'll, we'll talk about the pronunciation in a minute. Andrew. But Andrew. <laughs> could you uh, give everybody a little bit of your background since most of these folks are not in the defense industry? And, and we're not in Atlanta. And you're so, not in Atlanta. Yeah, of course. So uh, just a little bit of your background and uh, some of the recent events I think always are interesting for people. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, KP. Um, I'm Matt Grimm. I'm co-founder of Andrel, a, a, a nasally A, Andrel, Andrel Industries. Uh, we make a number of products, including these two drone products that you see here, and we'll walk through what those are. Um, a bit about me, I went to school at Cornell. I went to, after Cornell, I went to go work at Booz Allen Hamilton for uh, just shy of a year. Uh, left there to go work at Palantir Technologies, is a big uh, data consultancy, data analytics software company uh, that, that does a lot of business with the federal government. Um, left there to go uh, to Mithril Capital, which is one of the venture capital firms in Peter Thiel's family. Uh, was there for a couple of years and then left there to start Anderol. So here we are. So. I know when you guys have talked to us about defense, you know, one of the theses, much like construction and kind of these traditional industries, there just hasn't been a ton of innovation for a lot of years. Yeah. I mean, what, I, mean I, I remember when you talked to me about it and you said, hey, I'm, we're going to do this defense company. Um, and you're not doing it in Silicon Valley. You're in Southern California. Orange County, in fact. Orange County. Yeah. Um, I was like, okay, defense company? Like, why? Like, why? Um, and your your response was like because they're not they're not getting it done, amongst other things. Sure, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the the whole the whole thesis of the company that we've started is that uh, the pace of innovation in the defense industrial complex, if we'll call it that, uh, has largely slowed over the last thirty years. So if you think of the things, the major innovations in the last uh, hundred years in that space. Uh, you'd think of things like GPS technology or stealth technology or uh, long-range uh, strategic airlift capability or even things as far back as aircraft carriers or about um, submarines or th that sort of technology. And if you reflect on the last 30 years of that sector, uh, we haven't really seen significant sort of game-changing innovation in that sector. So uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about why that is and how we can maybe bring a different approach to the sector. Uh, we have a few theses, um, one of which is the contracting process, as it's so designed, um, encourages a very waterfall-driven style of procurement where you specify up front exactly what program must do X, program must do Y, program must do Z, and then go out and hire somebody who then uh, hire engineers that will bill by the hour to build that. So I'm sure all of you have worked with lawyers and accountants and et cetera. It's like if you bill by the hour, you can uh, tend to in encourage uh, things to take longer. So. Um, and then the third thesis that we had was that there was a talent gap at play where um, working in some of these old, uh, more kind of stodgy traditional companies like Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman are a little bit more bureaucratic. They're more, um, more, more khakis and button downs, ironic given what I chose to wear today. Um, less flip flops and uh, flip flip flops and polo shirts or flip flops and Hawaiian shirts as Palmer's known for wearing. 
Um, so just we wanted to make a specific call to uh, that kind of category of talent who was going to go work otherwise at Google or Facebook or Amazon or Dropbox or Palantir or Tesla or SpaceX, and we wanted to incentivize them to specifically come work on defense technology problems. So we started the company with the thesis of building uh, a product company first, so we'd raise our own venture capital, which we've been pretty successful doing. Uh, that we would then go uh, hire that kind of uh, single Silicon Valley talent who wouldn't have been interested in going to work at a big traditional bureaucratic type of uh, defense contractor, um, and that we would then um, build build these products on our on our own dime, not billing by the hour, and then bring them to market and say, hey, do you want to do you want to buy this rather than the opposite, which is to say, uh, sure, you can hire us and we'll charge you by the hour. So, um, so so that's what we do. We have uh, three three main product lines. We have uh, the the heli drone that we call Ghost, which is the big one there. Um, um, is a, uh, capable of about an hour and a half of flight time um, with a uh, four cameras on the front, two nighttime cameras, two daytime cameras, and a laser pointer. Um, folds into a small case. I don't know if any of you happen to see me lugging it up here. It's about the size of a, like a tr gun case on wheels. Uh, it's back here. You'll see me loading it up in a minute. Um, and then a, the, uh, the smaller drone is our newest product. That's our counter drone product. It's called, um, called Interceptor. Uh, if you've paid attention to the news over the last few days, seeing some of the, uh, the attacks in Saudi Arabia, to say nothing of the past few months and some of the disruptions around London's Gatwick Airport and sort of the increasing frequency of uh, concern about small drones and security measures there. So uh, we've built a, a counter drone solution of which the, uh, the Interceptor there is one part of it. Um, and then the, the last product is a uh, tower-based product that's essentially like a, um, a smart perimeter security product uh, we, that is deployed around military bases, is deployed around critical infrastructure like oil refineries or airports, uh, is deployed on international borders, including our southern border, um, and is uh, essentially think of it as a very, very smart um, tool for situational awareness. So you can have uh, users out in the field, whether they're military police or whether they're border patrol agents or private security around an, an airfield or something, uh, have a phone. You say, I want them to, I want the system to scan in this area. Let me know anytime you see a person or a vehicle or uh, a drone or a plane or a boat or whatever the, whatever the use case dictates, you can spe specify some parameters for what normal is and then say, send me an alert anytime there's something that's not supposed to be here. And the user in the field gets a little ping and they look at, and they say, oh, I get pictures of it live. And I say, oh, I have to go that way to intercept. Uh, so there's a lot of applications that's pretty broadly deployed. Um, it, unfortunately, it's gigantic and fits into the back of like a, like a huge steak bed truck. So it does not make for, uh, for good conference demo material, but it nonetheless exists. This was enough to carry through Atlanta Airport. I didn't, we did not, did not need more. What, uh, we had talked about like talent. Right? Yes. Like that's, you know, there is an aging talent. Mm -hmm. um, you're in Southern California. One of the things, just sitting here in Atlanta, um, you know, everything amazing happens in Silicon Valley, according to Silicon Valley. Yeah, of course. Sure. Uh, <laughs> the, o the only smart people are the ones there. Right. Sure. Of course. You guys chose to be in Southern mm -hmm. California, uh, much better weather. Mm -hmm. um, how has recruiting? The recruiting challenge been yeah. for you? So I would say location is our number one challenge on recruiting. Um, I would say that if you're a young person who wants to work in finance, it's like New York is sort of the mecca for that. If you're a young person who wants to work in media, LA is sort of the mecca for that. And if you're one, a young person who wants to write software, then San Francisco, uh, formerly, formerly Palo Alto, now San Francisco, would be the the mecca for that. So um, amongst the, the, the younger college crowd, location is the number one problem that we have, um, for sure. Uh, that said, we do exceptionally well with the second and third job candidates. Um, I don't know if, if any of you are from California, if you uh, read the headlines, but it is obscenely expensive to live and operate a business in the Bay Area. So for folks who are in their late 20s, early 30s, looking at their second or third employment opportunity and thinking about what's next for them and their family, uh, you know, looking at buying a very small house in the in the sticks where they're going to have to commute a really long way to get to work versus um, and and uh, you guys even have more of an advantage here in Atlanta. Uh, it's way more affordable down where we are in Orange County to be able to afford uh, a better a better house and a better school district and all of that. So we do a little bit better with uh, with, with with the slightly older candidates, um, which I think in turn leads to a slightly different culture that we have. We don't have as much of the um, sort of uh, red solo cups, late night partying at the office kind of culture. We have much more of the um, have to leave at six to get my kids, uh, pick them up from the nanny to get them into bed by seven kind of culture. So um, so yeah, we do very well with that. To say nothing of when we go out to recruit, we are specifically looking for people who are recruit, uh, excited about our mission and excited about national security, excited about this space. So folks who 
uh, would have maybe otherwise gone to work at a Google or a Dropbox or something like that, but you know, really just wanted to go were maybe patriotic, maybe they wanted to go uh, support the military, work in those sorts of uh, communities. We can we can go find those people and pluck those people out of uh, what would otherwise be a traditional software kind of career. And that works pretty well for us. Y'all just had a funding round this week. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Well, ink is ink is barely dry. Yeah. Yeah, ink is barely dry. Yeah. Want to for our startups, they always get excited about hearing about funding rounds. Okay, so um, I'm almost embarrassed about it. So it's it's pretty insane. Um, so we closed a 120 million dollar financing round about two weeks ago, um, led by uh, General Catalyst and Founders Fund, with participation from uh, Andreessen Horowitz and Lux Ventures and Date BC and uh, and, a, and a few others. So um, it brings our total raised to about 180 million over two and a half years, um, which is going to fund the next about three three and a half years of growth. D depends on. Depends on how fast we spend it, but uh, about the next three years of growth of the company, and then um, you know we'll grow to about 400 employees. We're 125 now, so about 400 employees on this fundraising round. And y'all just opened up a new facility. I think what's really cool is it's it's software, it's hardware, it's it's all of the above. Yeah. Which you know, it in the world of what people are building today, there's just a lot of software, sure. etc. Um, I think it's interesting because it's a multidisciplinary team, right? You're mechanical engineers and maybe some machinists and AI, computer vision. You right. know, what, what has it been getting everyone to kind of work together and kind of the product management aspect of yeah, multidisciplinary it's a team? It's a challenge. So I would, I would step back and say uh, that uh, as I described the products, this, these two and then the tower-based product, um, connecting all of them is a software layer. So they all run a very similar software protocol, similar communication and security protocols. So there's a very uh, sort of a shared software layer that exists underneath each of these individual product lines. Um, so the majority of our engineers are software engineers who work on that on that core code. And then there's uh, smaller teams of hardware engineers who are designing the actual physical airframe or designing the actual uh, the actual housing for some of the uh, CPUs on board. So, um, so for us as a as a team, uh, what it really comes down to is having uh, clear customer interactions and clear feedback from customers. So it's it's one of the major challenges in in doing work with the government is getting clear signal from them. So we've been able to uh, both through our network, through um, our experience, including my own at Palantir, through hiring a number of veterans, particularly out of the special forces community. Uh, we've been able to feed into the engineering process very good, very recent, very tactical advice about, uh, particularly when it comes to the drone product, about you know, it's, uh, if, if you guys pay attention to the drone space, there's a lot of drones on the market. There are a lot of companies who compete in the uh, drones for military space. So like, what are the pros and cons? What works well? What doesn't work well? Um, what uh, different uh, compelling product lines could be, what different features could be. So feed feeding that in, that, that then begs the obvious question that you have around how do you pr keep folks on the same page about that. So um, there are a number of things we do, uh, first of which is have a fairly rigorous uh, product management process in place. So uh, led by my co-founder, Brian, who's the CEO of the company, we have a, uh, a good funnel from um, we'll, we'll, we'll call it noisy feedback from the field cause, um, around, we want this, we want that, I want it to fly longer, I want it to do this or that. Uh, we, when we sort of funnel that into a process that then he works with the engineering team to, to tri triage and prioritize uh, the amount of time any given thing could take, the kind of relative importance given to any of the deals. So there, there, there's a framework and a process by which we can whittle down to, okay, the, the operating priorities for the engineering team on the ghost helicopter will be a, B, and C in this order, and we're going to target A being done by end of this week, B being done by end of the month, some, et cetera, like that. So that, that, that's one piece. Uh, the second piece that I think um, shouldn't be underrated uh, is that we're extremely exceptionally transparent about the direction of the business and the deals we're chasing and the customers we're chasing. So um, the, the deal pipeline for uh, every single deal we're chasing, both in the government and the commercial and in international, everything is uh, fully transparent, fu fully viewable to anyone in the company. So uh, any of the engineers who are building, say, the, the Interceptor can easily go look with a few fl clicks and see uh, what customers are thinking about buying it and who's the account lead, who's the sales lead on each of those things, which gives a pretty tactical way for them to then go say, like, hey, Evan, uh, I saw you're talking to this particular uh, UK unit. Um, you know, what do you think about this feature or that feature? Or have they looked at this? Or just be able to provide that connective tissue such that we don't end up with the problem that a lot of companies, especially those that do business with the government have, where you have a sales team out that's selling who knows what, and then engineering on the other end, who's being fed requirements without a lot of context, we're explicitly trying to, uh, to, to bridge that gap 
by uh, by increasing the transparency. Um, and then the third, along along those lines, I would say that we also um, are uh, pretty open and aggressive about uh, having employees share their experiences from, uh, in particular, the veterans from their time serving. Um, many of them have recently gotten out. For for most of them, were their first job after having left the military. So, um, and they'll do roundtables. They'll do sort of. Uh, you know, round, uh, brown bag lunch type events where they'll sit and talk about, um, you know, this time I was here and I was using this technology and this thing failed and we had to do, we had to adapt and it's sort of the uh, kind of traditional war stories thing, but vis-a-vis -vis technology that helps, helps both culturally, people kind of feel connected to that community, but also then helps uh, feed into the product kind of thinking and mindset. And you all have products in the field. Oh yeah. Currently. Yeah, we're going to do uh, between 40 and 45 million in business this year. Nice. Um, and hence that's the fundraising round. So <laughs> yes, uh, not bad for a startup. Um, the the ghost. Yes. Um, no, I'm not a copter guy, but sure. I know like quadcopters are more stability, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's not a quadcopter. No, very much not. What's the why? Uh, a few things. So um, so quadcopters. Uh, one of the reasons that they became very popular uh, is because they're very stable and they're pretty they're pretty hard to screw up. So it's it's easy to, um, you know, once you get a good flight controller on that can do the very basic kind of stabilization, you can provide an interface to a user that's just like go that way and the drone will just move. It's pretty pretty straightforward. You don't have to worry about a lot of gains on collective or particular you know chop on tail road or any sort of particular weird uh, aerodynamical nuances. Um, so you get a very stable airframe. Uh, the downside is efficiency. They're they are they're woefully inefficient, which is why you end up seeing uh, flight times of a typical consumer drone of the you know, twenty to twenty five, sometimes thirty minutes, something in, in in that range. So you just you don't get the aerodynamic efficiency out of the quadcopter. Just the way the physics work of having the dead weight on the four props is uh, is not very efficient. Um, these would be the helicopter. Uh, the helicopter is way more efficient. So um, as mentioned, we can get about ninety minutes of air of, of air time on our largest battery pack. Uh, it's also um, way faster, so we can get to about 95 miles an hour in, in cruise on the cell cap, which is terrifying. Um, we can go really, really, really fast, which then gives us a, a larger effective range. So you could imagine a use case where a, uh, a, a soldier opens up the, the, the box assembles the helicopter in a, in a few minutes. I mean, I assembled it backstage wearing wearing this, so you can put it together in about five minutes. Uh, they can take off, fly, say, uh, you know, 30, 35 miles that way, can can send, can patrol around and then and then head straight back when it's on uh, bingo battery. Uh, that's just the kind of use case that you're not going to get out of your, out of your average quadcopter just because of the physics and efficiency of it. Um, the downside is, of course, control and stability. So it takes uh, a lot of training to uh, fly this fly by stick. Um, I, I can't do it. I'm not allowed to fly them. Um, which, uh, but for our users, they don't fly by stick. They fly completely by computer, completely by screen. They just say, go here, and it does all of its aerodynamic planning. It does all of its mission planning. It'll know that there's a, he a hill here. We preload it with all of the topographic data we can get our hands on. Uh, so it'll, it'll, it'll plot its own route through, say, like a mountain, a mountain valley to get to a target and then go on a patrol. We designate it. So you're never actually worried about um, you know adjusting the gain on any particular uh, propeller or, or not it's just not um, not how the thing flies hence why you uh, offered not to fly it yeah not yeah you wanted me to fly it in here that was a terrible idea <laughs> um, I was like you're gonna fly maybe, gonna maybe in like a big big cage but no I don't want this is not a good idea um, do you see do you see other competitors coming after this space now I mean I mean y'all have been kind of pioneers um, it's not your typical startup are people starting to say hey they're making progress and okay i would say a few things um so yes and no so i would say that uh traditionally GovTech companies that do business with the government um particularly in in the dod have uh have largely been shunned by the investor community so um uh, dr carp who's a ceo of palantir and a, a longtime mentor and friend of mine um would, is fond of the story how it was so hard to raise money for palantir in the early days because they'd say oh we're, we're going to spend multiple years building this thing um we're just going to be burning cash not seeking revenue and then oh we're, our customers eventually going to be the government to which venture capitalists would just kind of laugh at them and, and move on um so that pendulum has largely shifted where we found that uh, investors are much more willing to 
accept the long cycles that it, it can take to go from a, an initial meeting to a scoping to a contracting to a closed deal to a delivered product to uh, actual revenue recognized. Um, if that process can take 18, 24 months for some of our customers, it has taken that long for some of them. So for, for, for most typical startups, uh, you're in this space where you're saying like, I have six months, nine months, 12 months of runway. I just physically can't afford to go chase an 18 month sales cycle. So that uh, almost precludes, you know, puts like a little bit of a capital barrier in place between companies being able to go tackle this space. So vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis that though, um, I mean, it's a very uh, sort of loose capital market these days. It's pretty easy to uh, go raise money for new ideas. So it's been easy for us to go uh, I, w I wouldn't. I wouldn't say easy. That minimizes the effort that we put into it. But um, it, it has not been a battle to go raise money for for the venture. So, so one thing I'd say is that it's been easier to go um, start a business in the sector and kind of get 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 momentum and get interest from investors that can then fund you through some of these long product development and long sales uh, sales cycles. So we have seen a few other. Uh, companies who have come out and said, well, we're going to specifically target government, we're going to specifically target DOD. Uh, what we haven't seen is we haven't seen anybody who's taking the sort of diversified uh, hardware plus software uh, sort of broad approach that we've taken. We've, we've mostly seen like um, we build an AI product that does X and we're going to go try to sell X to the government. Um, or we're go we build a drone that does Y and we're going to go sell Y to oil and gas or, uh, or the government or private security or whatever, um, we've, we, we haven't seen anybody take the uh, sort of diversified broad approach that we're taking yet, yet, maybe we will. Cool, very cool. Um, I know you guys are hiring. We what are. are. What are y'all looking yeah. for? I mean, yeah. you, you got to start yeah. hiring, Android. right? Yeah, androll.com slash careers. <laughs> um, so uh, we're hiring um, for a, a a number of positions. The most critical need we have is, of course, full stack software engineering. Um, and then there are a number of uh, particularly uh, niche software jobs related to that, particularly around robotics, like path planning, uh, computer vision, um, some of the more um, low level tactical sort of controls around sort of firmware and basically the interface between the hardware and the software products. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, the usual mechanical engineers and electrical engineers for building these really cool products we have. So um, I'm also hiring a lawyer. So if anybody knows any lawyers, we, we need one, we need more of them. I don't think we let them. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, hopefully you didn't invite any, but. Um, we have one, but I think. I should probably stop insulting them in my recruiting pitch yeah, if, I, if I want them to join well. the team. Yeah. Um, you mind taking a couple questions? Fire away. Sure. Any questions, y'all? I know I'm standing between you, you and cocktails, yeah. so I, my, I appreciate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can you tell us how you're Ah, I can indeed. Um, okay. So I can give you uh, sort of the high level specifics um, if we want to get into the very kind of nuanced uh, discussion around terminal terminal guidance that is a little bit over my technical head. Um, I got a mechanical engineering degree, but haven't used it in about 15 years. So I uh, will be making most of that part up, but I can tell you the basics. Uh, so the basics are that there are uh, a number of ground-based sensors that are actually based on the, uh, the tower-based platform that we had, sort of where the idea came from. Um, the tower-based product has a radar system on it that you can think of essentially as a very long-range, very sensitive, uh, very expensive motion detector. Um, but the, the radar is not that smart. So the radar can say, hey, I think something's moving over there. They might want to look at that. So that uh, interfaces with then a camera system. The camera system is using, um, think of it as, as being on a pan tilt unit, so it'll go like, and it'll kind of look up where the radar says it, it thinks it detects something. Uh, the camera will take a bunch of pictures and see if it can identify it. So based on things like flight patterns, uh, sort of known shapes of aircraft, uh, known shapes of vehicles, um, there's a lot of training data out there around detecting humans in, a, in, a, in an image. So um, the, the camera will then take a bunch of pictures and it'll try to decide what it is. With a, with a degree of certainty. Um, that all then feeds into this uh, sort of decision-making tree, which on the, on the tower product can lead to, oh, there's not supposed to be a person here, send an alert to a user, or there's not supposed to be a vehicle here, send an alert through. Vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the interceptor product, what ends up happening is it says, uh, we think we see something over there. It's definitely above the horizon, so we can not even look for uh, cars or, or, or people or boats or something. It's definitely above the horizon. We think it's a drone. Let's analyze it and let's watch it. And you can watch kind of the flight patterns or what it's doing. For example, birds don't just hover in one place. Birds will be moving. So you can see, is the thing moving around? Like, what's it doing? Take a bunch of pictures, try to make a decision, and then uh, it'll submit to a user and say, we think we see a drone over here. Uh, the user... We'll then click a button that says to go investigate. Um, the, the interceptor will take off. 
Uh, it's insanely fast. So I'm well, uh, you guys are willing to play with it afterwards, but it has very, very, very large props and very large motors relative to your average sort of DJI Mavic or other drone that you might get at a Best Buy or a Walmart. Um, so it can fly about 85 miles an hour. So it'll, it'll launch itself off the ground and then fly very fast out to, uh, out to find where it thinks this drone is. Uh, any in individual sensor, whether that's the camera, whether that's the radar, all have some sort of an error band around it. So you can't precisely pinpoint down to the centimeter where something is, especially as it's moving around in 3D space. So what happens is the interceptor will then go uh, fly underneath where it thinks it is and then look up. So if you'll, uh, if you'll see on the, on the top of it here, um, there are a couple of cameras there um, that, are, that, are, that are looking at you. Um, he, he, he has a very kind of disappointed, confused face that he's making there with his cameras. Uh, so he will then fly under and look up. Uh, and then it'll identify uh, using some computer vision algorithms completely on board. So inside there is, a, is, a, is a, uh, a CPU that's doing all this processing. So it'll identify any blobs that are moving in the image. And then it'll send that back to a user and say, hey, we found it. This is it. What do you want me to do? And the user will say, well, uh, follow or ignore, or return to base, or uh, the fun one of, uh, of, of terminate. And then it'll line itself underneath. And then I mentioned the acceleration before. It'll accelerate really, really fast. And then it'll just ram into it really, really hard. So um, it, is, it is exactly as fun as it sounds like. Um, so the, this guy is pretty heavy. So uh, there's no battery on this one, because if you've ever tried to ship a battery, it's a, it's a world of pain. You don't want any to do with. So we didn't bring batteries. But with, with loaded with the battery, it's about 10, 12 pounds. So it gets going at a pretty good, a pretty good clip. It's pretty heavy, and then just hits the thing. And if it, if it misses, say like there's something that kind of dodges at the last second, it'll just come back around, reacquire, and then just keep trying over and over again until it'll hit it, and then it'll uh, knock the thing out of the sky. So yeah. Um, which, which is, uh, it's, it's pretty fun. It's a little scary, especially for some cases where it's like uh, a drone flying directly at you. So we've done a bunch of test scenarios that are like fixed wing drones, quadcopters, hexcopters, all sorts of different sizes, different payloads. Um, and when, it's, when there's something coming at you and it's, trying to, and it's trying to intercept, you really hope it hits it before it gets overhead. But, um, but it, works, it works pretty well. I mean, we have, we have, we have kill ratios well north of 90%. So we're, we're, we're pretty proud and happy with it. Would that, would that, I mean, I don't know what we know about the Saudi Arabia attack. Would that have been able to intercept? And I don't think we know enough yet. Okay. Details are pretty sketchy, but um, at, a, at a bare minimum, the, um, the sort of the frame that we're building with the ground-based sensors that can detect, kind of, kind of distinguish what different targets are. I mean, you don't want to dispatch this thing to go chase after, say, like a, uh, a Cessna on final approach to an airport or something. Like, you have to be able to be smart about how you fuse all that sensor data and how you make the decisions around it. Um, but uh, a little, I think a little too soon to tell. Truth, truth. I mean, it, de it depends. It depends on the scenario. I mean, if you're in Af if you're in Afghanistan and the thing's carrying ordnance at your base, you absolutely want to ram it. I mean, if you're in, I don't know, Atlanta and there's something carrying something towards the brand new Mercedes Stadium or something, you probably don't. But um, it depends on the circumstance. This is why we give uh, users in the loop to make the decision about. We see this thing, we've acquired it, we've taken pictures, we've gotten close. What, what do you want me to do about it? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so at the moment, our, our cost for them uh, retails in the neighborhood of like $20,000, $25,000. Um, we're working on getting the bomb costs down. For, for us, there are a few critical components on there that are a little expensive that if we can shift to different components or either drive prices down, then we'll be able to lower that price down. So um, it's pretty easy to imagine um, like, an, like an airport or a stadium buying a handful of them at that price tag. What? Oh, the big one, uh, big one retails for about 150. How many would you like? Indeed. Yep. Hence the, <laughs> hence the revenue traction. Is we're, doing, we're doing pretty well selling them because we've, we've been able to uh, develop them quickly, get them out to the field quickly, get feedback quickly, and then iterate onto a, uh, a good stable version. Um, we're selling pretty fast. Yeah, it's hard. Um, it's really hard. So on the, uh, on the helicopter itself, um, 
we have not gotten into too much of that yet. You'll, I mean, you're welcome to come up and see afterwards the uh, the swash plate assembly on the top of it, particularly fragile and uh, and and very sensitive to granular dust like like um, sand. But uh, the smaller drone is not, so the interceptor is not as susceptible to that. The larger drone is, and we're working on a, uh, a swappable headpiece. Essentially, think of the swash plate, uh, all those connecting rods, all of that together into about a soda can looking thing that kind of plugs on top of a motor and encloses all of that sensitive stuff. Because the, the rest of it, the gimbal on the front, the uh, computer on the side, um, this guy can, has the, uh, the computers and NVIDIA TX2 on the side that powers all of the flight decision making and all of the, uh, all the computer vision detections, all of that. Um, that's all enclosed and, 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 and pretty stable. It's really just that, uh, that gearing and swash plate assembly at the top that is most environmentally susceptible. Um, and worst comes to worst, we just end up shipping a, a, a drone with three or four of those uh, of those swashplate assemblies for swappability in the field. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. For real estate, I I would buy an Inspire. I'd strap a computer to the bottom of Inspire and have that fly around. That would be, a, I, th I think, a much more realistic solution than, than what we're trying to do here. Um, harder to tell uh, on some oil and gas things is like if you had very, very long pipelines, if you had um, very large refineries that you wanted to sort of pr patrol the perimeter of, like there, there are a number of applications that could be interesting, but really it's a uh, cost to flight time to mission criticality element that, that, that's worth considering. All right, one more question. Anybody's got one? And then cocktails. And then cocktails. And, and you said you're a sure. folks coming yeah. up and taking a look. Yeah. If you want to nerd out, hmm? come check it out. All right. Thanks so much, man. All right. Great. Thanks. Have fun.